Well, hello folks, here we are again with another teeny tiny technical tutorial from New SLLC. That would be we. We're going to look at RJ45, Ethernet, and windmills. And you say, what in the world is the relationship there? Well, I'm not going to tell you what this little cartoon is all about because you got to be either really widely read or very old. Um, but the point of it is the meme persists. And what he's telling you basically here is that uh, a lot of stuff you think is true is not true. You can read this stuff for yourself. Uh, but I got to tell you this ice cream dilemma. It's a little fable in uh, truth in a technical fable from uh, us. Uh, in the, uh, back in the dark ages, somebody uh, invented this stuff. They called it ice cream. Uh, and it had just one flavor, which had no name because that's what it was. It was ice cream. Uh, and it was a registered trademark of North American Wiebelfetzer. It fell out of trademark, though, so now you don't have to capitalize it. It's just a generic word, ice cream. Uh, and other people created other flavors, but uh, nobody had the name for the original one, so they finally stuck a word on there called vanilla. So now we had this thing called vanilla, which was the original flavor of ice cream. So what happened, of course, is um, everybody thought ice cream meant vanilla, right? They became synonymous. So when a customer would go into a store and say, give me some ice cream, they would get vanilla because everybody thought ice cream was vanilla, right? Got it? So you'd have to ask for chocolate or strawberry, whatever you wanted. Um, well, this is the same thing with the RJ45 and Ethernet. It's ice cream. They're generic terms. You can use them, but they're not descriptive enough. You really don't know if you're getting strawberry or chocolate when you say ice cream because everybody knows it's vanilla. All right, so let's look a little bit of Jack here. I'll give you an easy one. This is a um, residential uh, jack right here and, of course, a plug that goes with it. Uh, the residential jacks uh, have six positions, see, six positions. And uh, usually they only have four contacts, see, 6P, 4, or 6C. So uh, when you wire one phone, you'll use these two pins right here, and you put the colors down the right way, it becomes an RJ11. If you have two phones, you put the colors down the right way, the same uh, jack becomes an RJ14. If you uh, put three phones down in the right positions right here, and you have a six right, contact, which is unusual, but... Uh, so you've got a six uh, position six contact, you wire it down like that, it becomes an RJ25. It is not an RJ25 when there's no wires on it. It's not an RJ14 when there's no wires on it, and it's not an RJ11 when there's no wires on it. It's a 6P4 or 6C. That's what it is. Okay, but everybody uh, in the LAN world, of course, is using these 8-pin modulars. Well, guess what they are before you put any wire on them? They're an 8P8C simple as that or if you could ever find one like this 8p6c that's what they are they're not rj45 they're not rj anything they're an 8 piece 8c you okay with that that's what it is so when people start saying hey i want an rj45 you don't really know what the heck they're talking about they're assuming that you know what you know what they're talking about and i've found an awful lot of people don't know what they're talking about the original RJ45 was a wiring uh, uh, specific that used the two pins of this 8-pin modular. And not only that, it was an, a keyed 8-pin modular. So it was an 8-position, eight 8 contact with a key on it. So you couldn't take this plug and put it into what everybody is calling an RJ45. It wouldn't fit into an 8P8C standard, all right, because it had a key. So this is the only place that an RJ45 is correct. is because it's a, like an electrical standard, how you put the wires down and its function. It was some kind of data function. I've never seen one of these. And I'd be willing to bet you 99.99% .99 of the people um, saying RJ45 have never seen one either. They're using it like ice cream to mean this. But they can't determine the flavor. <laughs> Right, uh, so it's been you know it's ice cream, but take my word for it because I've been doing this for years. I use that very same eight pin, uh, uh, eight pin, eight uh, position, eight contact for a T type and E type carrier. It's called an RJ forty eight C. It's still an eight by eight until I put the wires down. Then it becomes an RJ forty eight. Other than that, it's just a plug and a jack. We went through the same ridiculousness um, years ago and still are uh, on the. 232 interface 
because everybody and their brother said the D sub, the physical thing here with all these pins, 25 pins in it, the D sub was the EIA 232 interface. Not true. You could put a 232 up on a, something other than a D sub, but that it was the same kind of thing, and we're still doing that. Somebody will hold up this D sub on the end of a cable and say, that's a 232. Yeah, well, it might be electrically the 232, but the, that's just the plug and the jack. It has nothing to do with the 232 itself. All right, so uh, if you're going to wire these up, and there's lots and lots of stuff on the net that shows you how to do it, and they all say it's an RJ45. I saw a guy, you know, going real <laughs> ballistic on the fact that so many people didn't know how to wire up an RJ45. Well, guess what? He wasn't wiring up an RJ45 either. Yeah, uh, a little tangent there. Uh, the color code in the telephone industry has been this in the United States for many years. Uh, blue, orange, green, brown, slate with a white. And then the next set, blue, orange, green, brown, slate with a red, and like that. Um, in the lands, you only need four pairs, so you get away with just this section up here, right? Blue and blue, white, orange, see, blue, orange, green, brown, right? Slate, we, ne we never called this gray. Still don't. But you gonna, don't have to worry about it if you're in a LAN arena because you ain't going to get there anyway. Okay, so let's look at the 8-pin modular, modular. And none of these is an RJ45. This is the Ethernet, 10 base T, uh, you know, CSMA, CD, whatever term you want. I guess you can use Ethernet as long as you don't capitalize it. But here's the dilemma is that there's two forms that are valid, the EIA 568A and B. And you'll notice the color codes here are not quite the same where you punch the, the wires down on the pins. So you know, all the whiz-bang dudes out there that keep calling this thing the RJ45, uh, well, is this one the RJ45? Or is this one the RJ45? Or even yet, is this one the RJ45? Well, guess what? This 8-pin modular, when it's pinned out this way, is for T&E carrier, and it's called an RJ48. And these over here don't have an RJ. They have an EIA. So you just keep calling these RJ45s. Um, you're you're going to confuse people because when they come in and pick that little plug up and look inside of it, they're going to say, is this RJ45? And you'll say, yes. And then they'll look at the other one and say, well, is this the RJ45? And you'll say, yes. And they're not the same. So have a beat you up on that. Okay, here we go. Let's look at some land stuff. Uh, early on, there was two competing forms. What you, you know, pr pretty much everybody thinks is the land standard now, which is uh, lowercase Ethernet. Uh, actually, 802.3, because the Ethernet uh, trademark owned by Xerox was relinquished, relinquished 1983. So it's no longer a trademark. It's like a generic term for some number-based T systems. Uh, but the original one was on uh, hard cable, big thick stuff. So are we still calling it Ethernet correctly? You know, I guess if you want to use the lowercase one. But there was another competing technology, and most people don't know too much about this now because it got beat out because it got, was too expensive and a couple other reasons. But uh, Token Ring really had some advantages. Uh, it was deterministic. Uh, it was a ring here, and the computers could only send if they had a little wad of data. They were hanging onto this little thing called a token. Uh, so they could only transmit when they had the token, and they'd pass the token around. So you could determine who was going to get access and when, whereas uh, our uh, 10 base and so on lands, they, they function on a bus, even if it looks like a star, and they all have to contend for the access. There's no controller. There's no big kahuna saying, okay, you can go, okay, you can go. Uh -uh. They all jump on there together and then duke it out to see who's going to get the send. Okay, this um, is a very con um, involved slide. You need to pause your video and read through this uh, because I'm not going to do it. Basically, I want this string of bits to go from A down to E. And you can see how quickly they are moving and how many there are. And look, 
that electrical signal occupies the entire facility there, that coaxial cable thick net. And when that's happening from A to E, B cannot get on, C cannot get on, and D cannot get on. They have to wait until the line is clear. And then all of them are seeing the line is clear. They all simultaneously jump on here. And this guy's signal goes this way. This guy's signal goes that way. And it goes crash and hits right in the middle. So they both back off. All right. But the point I'm trying to make here with this slide is this, speed and rate. If you do not understand the difference between speed and rate, you do not have a hope in Hades of understanding the limitations and, and operational processes of 10 base T, uh, 100 base T, or just lowercase ethernet. You need to study this and watch. All right. So let's look at. compressing these bits down in time. Now, I don't know if you remember, you might have to back up, but that string of bits, the little black lines representing the time of each uh, bit was a lot wider. This one, this time, look, it's a lot shorter because all I've done is compress the bits down in time. So instead of being a, a one bit long, they're a half a bit long. All right. What does that mean? Are they going down the wire any faster? No, they're going as fast as electricity can travel through wire, both the larger ones and the, sh and the shorter ones. So what does that do for us? Well, from E's perspective, it took X number of seconds to get that long string of bits in when they all occupied, let's say, a second uh, of time. When they occupy a half a second, the same number of bits come in here and the guy collects them in less time, doesn't he? Because each bit is half as long as previous. So the bit rate goes up, but the velocity of the electrical signal down the wire does not change. So the speed always stays the same, always. But the rate can change by changing the time of the individual bits or bytes. <coughs> okay. Now, let's look at a little bit of this. Since I was talking about sending data down this wire, we actually do it in, in what are known as frames, a very generic term um, until you get into the specific system. We, we use framing all over the place. All it just really means is a beginning and end to a process. In this case, a string of bits. So I got a start and an end. OK. Now, there's this thing called the ISO OSI. It's been around for quite a while, International Standards Organization's Open System Interconnect Reference Model. You can go to either one of these specs to find it. It's a seven layer thing, but for our LANs, we only have to worry about one and two, and occasionally get off the LAN, we have to worry about three. Now, there's a bunch of things going on over here in this little drawing, and that's I want to spend a little bit of time to show you how this works. <clears throat> because some people don't know uh, really how it's all put together. Here's my computer terminals here, right here. And they have a media access unit, a NIC card, network interface card. And that's going to launch bits out onto a shared set of wires. All these black things right here are the wires and the plugs. This is the physical layer of the ISO model. Plugs, the jacks, the voltages, and so on. All this is related to the first physical level. Now, each one of these is going to create this string of bits, which is called a frame, a MAC frame. Although in my little drawing in, in the previous slide, it was a sack of bits. But this now, it's a MAC frame, right? So it's going to create a MAC frame that's going to have an address on it that's going to go from this guy, let us say, up to this guy. So when he puts that uh, string of bits on there, everyone is going to see those bits. Every place on these black lines is going to see those bits. But each one is going to uh, ignore it because it's not addressed to them. Only the person it's addressed to will actually suck them into his computer. right? So the data link then functions right, to address where the stuff should go and who it came from. Now, in this case, we're going through a, it says it's a repeater, but it's not. It's a regenerator. I'm being a stickler here because we really need to get the words right. A repeater, I worked on thousands of them. It repeats whatever is coming in. If you have a signal that's all trashed up, it's going to repeat trash. It's just going to make it louder. That's what a, a repeater does. It repeats what it sees and usually tries to amplify it in some way. 
these are regenerators. They look at a one zero signal, voltage on off on off, and they regenerate it. They do not repeat it. They do not amplify it. They put the same pattern out over here in a clean one and zero pattern. So it's a regenerator, not a repeater. It makes a difference if you work across systems, like where I came from. Because <clears throat> N carrier, K carrier, they all use repeaters, all of them. T carrier, digital, uses regenerators. Okay, so so now I come back up here to this on a black line. Everybody's got this, this data coming to them. This just lets the line be longer. So now I take this and I go up to here, all right? Now this is a bridge. It works at the data link layer. It looks at the frame addresses. And this thing is smart enough that it can figure out which uh, piece of this very big LAN um, where the addresses, uh, to from addresses are over here and the to from addresses over here. So let's say this guy has something to send to this guy. So it gets propagated out to everybody on all the black lines, including over here. This bridge looks at the frame address and it says, oh, that frame address should go up here. So it passes the information up through here, up through here. Over time, it learns where all the addresses are. Are they on this side or are they on this side? So from then on, the efficiency is when this guy sends something up to this guy, this guy says that address is not up here, so I will not pass it forward. All right? So we, we often call this filter forward. Um, because it looks at the address at level two. Now let's say that this guy is sending something that needs to go to New York City. What he'll do is create a frame that in, in, encapsulates a what we call a packet. In this case, internet protocol packets, most common thing that most people are familiar with. So he's got a frame now that is addressed, right? And it's going to go up here to the router because the router is going to examine the frame, the MAC frame, extract the IP packet, and send this into the cloud, right, the network. So it's going to pass these packets into the cloud. So there you go. It's all three pieces. This works at level three. This works at level two. And all these dudes down here are level one. So what's that frame look like? Well, here, I've given you some color codes right here for the 10 megabit 802.3, not Ethernet. Although I guess you can use it with a lowercase, not capitalized. The NIC card creates this string of bits. The first set right here is called the preamble, and it's just a whole bunch of 101, 101, 101, 101, like that. Because remember, this is going to go onto a shared bus. Everybody's going to try to get on there if no one's on, right? So this is like kind of a get out of my way, I'm coming, dude, because this is an electrical signal voltage variations, electrical um, value that it gets applied to the wire, to the transmission bus, right? So that's kind of gets everybody off, says there's something coming. So what is it? The start of the frame. So I got a, a byte here, right? These are not bits, these are bytes. So I've got a byte here that says, uh, to, to everybody effectively. Here's the start of the frame and here's who's it supposed to go to. Here who it is it came from right here and then this is how much I'm going to send and then the payload which is either 46 minimum or 15 maximum right here and this is the stuff we really want to send but we got to know who it's going to go to and who it's coming from right here. Now interestingly enough if the information down here is too short they're going to have to uh, this the Equipment's going to have to uh, do what they call padding, add some extra bytes to bring it up to 46. In the telephone world, I've been doing this forever, and it's called stuffing. <laughs> so I either stuff it or I pad it. How about that? All right. And then finally, there's a frame check sequence down here, which is a 32-bit 32, 32 cyclic redundancy check. It's a, it's a number that tells the receiver uh, what a uh, number value of all this should have been. If the, they don't match, we know there was a mistake, an error someplace on the transmission line. Okay, so what do those uh, numbers and letters mean? Well, 10 is 10 megabit digital rate, not speed, not speed, not speed. It's the rate. Okay, base is uh, 
the electrical bits on the LAN are not modulated. Uh, this word is used all over the place for sometimes very specific and sometimes very general terms. It means that the bits are stuck right on the wire and you don't do anything else with them. You don't th put them through a uh, conversion process of any type. We do, we, we do pulse code modulation where we take digital bits and turn them into different kind of digital bits. And that's called modulation, but uh, in this case we take those electrical bits out of the NIC and stick them on the wire without it doing anything else. T is the twisted pair, not coax, not coax. The original Ethernet with a capital E was uh, coax, uh, on coax. So twisted pair, transmit and receive. CSMA is carrier sense multiple access meaning um, each one of the terminals puts their toe in the swimming pool and checks for ripples. If there's ripples, there's somebody else messing around in the pool and only one person in the pool at a time. So they sense to see if there's somebody there, but there are multiple people that are doing that. So multiple access, lots of people can get on, but only one at a time by sensing if there's a carrier on there. If there's no carrier on there, they can launch their uh, frames, but guess what? Um, because the land, the, the bus can be pretty long, physically long, takes time, right, speed, it takes time for the electrical signal to propagate. So it's very possible two uh, terminals would send at the same time because they both uh, sense the line is clear, but because they're sending at exactly the same instant, their electrical signals collide, uh, so they detect that collision and they stop transmitting, do what's called a back off. They back off and wait a uh, random period of time and then try again. So could they crash again? Well, possibly, but if they crashed again, they'd wait even a different amount of time. So. Uh, intro tech to CSMA CD, the thing we just talked about, there's no master controller, there's no big kahuna saying you can go, now you can go. The frames can collide, they have to back off. It's usually a physical star, but it operates like a bus. Everybody's on the wire, or one at a time, but everybody has access to the wire. Propagation time, right, the speed, propagation for the physical path. Uh, distance determines the segment capacity, and you can get all those specs on how many uh, uh, computers you can hang off of one uh, section of a LAN. Well, how do you make it bigger? Well, put in a bridge. So this guy saying back off from this collision. This guy says, "No, man, get out of the way. I got here first. You know. So how do you do that? Well, you, you both back off, and one waits a random time and a different random time, and then try again. It's not deterministic." Operational evolution, how we got where we are from way back there. The first Ethernet with a capital E, thick cable, sometimes called thick net. 10 base 5, 10 megabits, 500 meters. It uses an attachment unit onto the big thick cable, about as big around as your thumb. I had to teach a bunch of people back in the, in the 80s how to do this. You had to actually make a hole in the coaxial cable and punch this thing in so that this thing would touch the center conductor of the coax. Right? And then you had the electrical unit here attached and then a cable going down to the computer. This was called a vampire tap because it was like <coughs> you had to stick it in there. Right? So it was a bus topology and a bus operation, plain as day. Well, advance a bit and the coax got thinner, nice and flexible like the stuff on your cable TV. Um, it's a base, a 10 base 2. Bus topology, bus operation, a thin net, thin thin coax, uh, uses BNC. Anybody know what that stands for? And yeah, there was speculation for years and years and years. I was in the military too. We use a lot of BNC connectors. I was in the Air Force and somebody said, no, that stands for bayonet naval connector. And I said, oh man, them, you know, swabbies, they don't know that much. And so it may be that bayonet naval connector. I'm not sure. And the NIC uh, network interface card is inside the terminal, the high tech terminal here, huh? Okay. This is what we really have now. It's the IEEE 802.3 standard. And everybody's still calling it Ethernet, but it's 802.3 because the Ethernet was proprietary. I guess if you can use a generic, huh? 10, 100, uh, even got thousands now. Uh, star topology, typically stars physically looking like a star, but it still operates like a bus. Everybody has to contend to get on the shared facility. Uses a twisted pair, uses an 8P8C modular plug and jack, 
not an RJ45. The NIC is in the terminal. So, my little electric electromite down here saying given all the physical electrical changes since the beginning coupled with the generalization of the name can we still call this Ethernet and yeah you can because you'll be just as wrong as everybody else and you know we're all in the same boat and if you use it generically that's fine yeah so don't worry about it. the land cops will not come breaking down your cubicle if you uh, you know continue to use that word and also RJ45 because you can't change the world hmm? So the truth will out uh, sometimes. Uh, and to quote Fred, you know who Fred is? When I was teaching uh, cartooning for kids for many summers, I would always bring in videos. And, and the one of them the kids liked the most was Super Chicken. And his sidekick, Fred, who's a, a lion, he'd always tell uh, Super Chicken, uh, you knew the job was dangerous when you took it. Mm -hmm. So... You try to straighten people out with RJ45 and uh, Ethernet, and you'll end up doing what I just did, which is making a very long video to explain what it is. And basically, you can just not pay attention to anything I said and keep using it like everybody else is. So thanks for watching. Um, see you back on another tutorial sometime. Roger, 10-4. Roger, Roger, I was almost go to the rubber ducky instead of the super chicken. Oh. See you later. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Josh Moab. We hope you enjoyed our little technology adventure and hope you'll share it with your family and friends. I really enjoyed our time together and hope you can join us on other adventures. Some of them are on the left-hand side of the screen. As always, we appreciate any help you can give by clicking on the support button in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Until next time, goodbye.